Okay, so a very key <laughs> concept in dealing with uh, regional diagnoses of biodiversity is how complete those, um, the data are across that region. And essentially what we want is a map that says here, my inventory is very complete, and very reliable, but here, eh, not so much. Okay, and that's gonna form the basis for a lot of the downstream inferences, both on the biological side and on the sampling side. So uh, this, this is a pretty key set of concepts. You know, in theory, you would think it's easy. You find somebody with expertise in a taxon, and you put that person in that place and you wait a little while until the expert says, I'm done, that's everything, okay? And it's, it's not that easy. I'm just gonna click down. Um, as you all know, many sites have not been surveyed in detail. Many taxa are hard to survey, okay? Um, you know, I suspect that Dorothy can go into a site and find five species and not find 50 other species that come out only during the rains or only after the rains or only in the peak of the dry season. Um, so there are hard taxa to detect and then in a lot of cases you go in and your first task is to describe the new species. So Moses can tell us about that with his, with his microplants where he even has one named after him. Um, and then even after the expert or somebody who wants to be an expert says, okay, I think I'm done, you need to think about that more carefully and make sure that you believe the expert. So that's where all of these other considerations come in. The spatial distribution of sampling, errors in taxonomy, et cetera, et cetera. So we really do need to be quantitative about this. So let's look a bit. Um, this is from the Mexican Atlas. This is that phenomenon that several of you have noticed that sampling follows roads. And that is true for very obvious reasons. You know, I've been involved in surveys in this gap here. It's called the Chimalapas region. And weeks of work just to get into the sites. And you know, between political problems and logistic problems and you know, no trail going above 600 meters. I mean, those of you who have done field work know what I'm talking about, okay? Those gaps are gaps for a reason. Um, so those are spatial gaps. And then we have temporal gaps we already talked about that one with, with the Mexican bird data. And then we just have these random gaps. So um, this is three different measures of, of um, degree of inventory. And you can see in all cases, these are frequency diagrams. So this is the you know, number of specimens, for example. Um, the highest category by far is zero. Okay, which is to say, for Mexican birds, obviously it depends on the size of the block, but most of the blocks have not been surveyed. Okay, and that is common. So, very generally, biodiversity tends to be too big to do what I would call inventory. Okay, think about if you were the owner of uh, a car dealership, okay? And at the end of the year, you need to understand what your stock of, of cars is. You're gonna go in and say, I have five of this model, three of this model, four of this model, and one of this model. You're not gonna go in and sample. I have around 
you know, four to six of this model and somewhere between zero and 10 of this model. So when you, you know, a car dealership is easy because e nobody has more than a few dozen. But when we're talking millions, you really can't do that exhaustive inventory. I'll come back to this concept at the end. Um, but it really takes us to a world of sampling rather than inventory, okay? And so there, in sampling, we're talking about estimating a quantity. And that quantity should be local single site diversity, okay? And so Arturo is going to talk with us quite a bit about what diversity means. But not today, not today <laughs> exactly. Um, but the point, my point is simply, and I'm not going to go into great detail to, so, to leave this to him, is that ideally we want a picture of the diversity at individual sites. And when we start aggregating, and remember our conversations about you know, a tenth of a degree, a half a degree, a degree, two degrees. That's aggregating. And so you start contaminating local site diversity with among site diversity. No more said about that, but that's what we would love to have. And it's very rare that we can have it. Okay? So really briefly, let's talk a little bit about sampling. Okay. When we talk about sampling, there are going to be some assumptions. And almost always we violate those assumptions, but we should at least be aware of them. Okay, we're talking about homogeneity or at least randomness of sampling across space. We're talking about homogeneity of sampling through time. And again, both of those, almost always, we violate those assumptions. So we have to be thinking about how much those violations of assumptions mean. Um, and this is perhaps the most important one. We have to be thinking about how comparable individual samples are. So this, for example, Rodrigue, this is why we were talking about should we combine GBIF data with your survey data? They're really different. And so one unit of sampling in you know, found data coming from herbaria around the world is very different from one unit of your sampling. Okay? And so that comparability is really uh, key. We're talking about samples accumulating knowledge in a consistent, comparab comparable way so that we can develop quantitative estimates from the samples. Now really this slide, which I thought was very creative, but others have said it's rather silly, this slide summarizes everything. Imagine we go to two different places and we start sampling. We're just detecting species. Which inventory is done at the end of these detections? The one on the right has one detection of each of um, nine different organisms. The one on the left has five and four detections of only two. But if I'm just going out and grabbing animals, <coughs> I think I've come to an end point here. I grabbed one and it was a rabbit. I grabbed another, and it was a kitten. I grab a third, and instead of being a dog, it was a rabbit. And so I grabbed lots of samples, and I really only found two species. But over here, every time I grab a sample, it's a different species. So if I graph the accumulation of species in this inventory, every time I take a new sample, I get more species. Whereas here, after a certain point, every time I took a sample, I detect another of the same species. 
So over here, I'm done. That's a completed inventory. And over here, definitely not. Okay? So we can, we can summarize this information Got it. Okay, thanks. Do you need this? So we can summarize our sampling information as a matrix of species by samples. Okay? And so this matrix, which is just going to have you know, kind of ones and zeros, Okay, that matrix is what we base a lot of these, these um, inferences on. Um, we can talk about three levels of detail. A full matrix is going to have all of the information in this matrix, um, including abundances. Now, for some of you, abundances make sense. Like when entomologists do trapping. You put out a trap, that's a very nice comparable unit of sampling, you know, one night of trapping, and you might get, you know, 40 of this species, 20 of this species, zero, two, five, and 10, okay? Or, you know, mammal people with, with um, traps. A simpler version is a presence-absence matrix where the content of the matrix is binary. And then what you will see perhaps most commonly is just the accumulation of species records. So that would be in the first sample, maybe it's the first day, I got one species. In the second day, I added one species to that. In the third day, I added three species to that. Clearly more information is better. Okay, so up here is better than down here. Um, many people believe that a lot of abundance data are falsely precise, and that is definitely the case with observational data. Um, a lot of the point counts and things like that that bird people do are all false precision, and so I personally don't put much stock in those data. Um, so the detail possible is often very much determined by what is possible, not by your preference. And then there are some kind of basics of this, that communities that have a lot of more or less equally abundant species will be the easiest ones to uh, characterize. So, communities with high evenness, if you remember back to your basic ecology classes. When you have dense sampling, obviously you're going to be able to do a better job. But when you have communities that have very rare species, so very big disparities in, in abundance, with some species that are hard to detect or very uncommon, those are going to be the hardest. That's all obvious. Okay, so we can look at some examples of species accumulation curves. Um, here's marine benthic communities. And you can see some of these communities, they start sampling and it levels off. And maybe these last 10 sampling periods, they didn't find any new species. And then you can see other inventories that are still going up even after lots of samples. 